We are going to attempt to broadcast the presentation by Dr. Peter Sharp of the Institute for Wildlife Studies, talking about the bald eagle and peregrine falcon restoration on the Channel Islands. So I see people are joining in. Um, hello from San Pedro, California, and um, Dr. Peter Sharp, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Well, most, if not all of you, know a lot about the Eagle Project. Um, so I'm going to give you more of the background and history of the project and then the current status of the eagles out on the islands. Um, and if you read our weekly updates, which are, which are not weekly right now, um, we also mention the peregrine falcon work. That's over half of what we actually do in our monitoring right now on the islands. So I'm going to introduce a little bit more about the peregrines as well. Um, both the eagles and the peregrines were once found on all eight of the California Channel Islands, but by the uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, they'd all been extirpated from the islands. Um, part of it was probably human persecution, especially with the bald eagles. Uh, bald eagles, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, were sort of considered like the sharks of the sky. This is a 1908 movie, um, oh, Rescue from an Eagle's Nest. Um, you know, a silent film. I don't know what a, a sub-adult is carrying a baby around. But, so it takes the baby, you can see it sitting in the nest up on the cliff, and they had to go re rescue it. But you know, this kind of thing made eagles seem like they were really, really dangerous. Oh, why is she coming back on? Oh, just, OK. So, you know, very rarely will an eagle actually do anything like this unless you're invading its nest. And, um, you know, I've been struck in the head before by an eagle. Um, now I wear a helmet. <laughs> um, so, because eagles had a bad reputation, people would often shoot them when they had the opportunity, especially out ranchers out on the islands. This is a picture from uh, the west end of the Catalina Island. People come out to hunt the goats that were out there, but you can, there's a woman on the right sitting there with a, a dead bald eagle as well. Um, for the peregrines, there was egg collecting, um, probably some falconry. Uh, but what really did in both these species was the introduction of DDT. Um, it was used widely in the Pacific during World War II to control mosquitoes and malaria. Um, after the war, they brought it back to the US and just sprayed it everywhere. Um, they like to spray it during your lunch hour. <laughs> I assume these were to show how safe it was for people. Yeah, how fun. <laughs> and it was in just about anything you could buy to uh, control insects in, in and outside of the house. So it was touted as being the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, this is an advertisement from a 19, late 1940s. Uh, Time Magazine or something. They thought it was good for your house, your your fruits, your cattle, your crops, everything. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't good for many birds and especially the raptors. Um, DDE, which is one of the metabolites of DDT or something that it breaks down into, <coughs> interferes with how birds lay down the, uh, but some raptors, I guess, lay down the eggshell. And essentially what happens is that the eggs break before the chicks can hatch. So there's very little reproduction. Um, the last known successful nest um, for peregrine falcons, I believe, was 1949 um, on Anacapa Island, and for bald eagles, 1950 on Santa Rosa Island. DDT was banned for use in the US and Canada in 1972, and by the late 70s, other species which had been impacted, such as the brown pelicans, we're again breeding on the islands. So at that time, uh, IWS decided to try to re reintroduce the bald eagles to the Channel Islands. We selected Catalina Island as the initial release point. Um, this island has the most access of any of the islands, daily um, ferries, helicopters. So it's easy to get to and from. The Catalina Conservancy, which owns most of the island, was willing to have us do our work out there. And the plan was to release eagles there, get a nice healthy population going. It would then extend out to the other islands and any mainland locations that were still suitable. 
because there weren't any eagles left, we had to go to areas such as Northern California, Washington, British Columbia, where they still had uh, healthy eagle populations. Look for nests that had hopefully two about seven to eight week old chicks in them. Um, we generally remove one and leave one for the adults to continue to raise. They're then brought back down to the Catalina, placed in a hacking tower, which is just a, a big cage on stilts, so that they're protected from, at that time it would have been pigs, foxes, um, and they get a good view of the surrounding area. They get the wind, wind under their wings. Uh, so we put them in there when they're about eight weeks old, feed them for about a month, and then when they're about 12 weeks old, they're ready to be released. Um, once they're past seven or eight weeks old, they can feed themselves. So all we had to do was slide some fish into the cages and really had very little contact with them. We would ban them before release, and that was going in after dark with headlamps and just sort of grabbing them, putting a hood on them, and banding them. So once they're about 12 weeks old, we would open the doors on the front, and the birds are free to go out on the, the front of the, the cage there, uh, get a little bit more exercise, and they might have been able to get inside the cage. Eventually, they get the guts to go up on top. And anywhere from a few minutes to a few days, they would take their first real flight. Um, because the adults usually feed uh, fledgling for about a month after um, they start flying, but we had no adults, we would put out food both on the tower, in the tower, and here we have uh, feral pigs that were put out on hilltops just to let the birds uh, start to find their own food figure out how to, to scavenge. So we released 33 eagles between 1980 and 1986. Um, many of these stayed on the island, formed breeding pairs, and we got our first eggs in 1987 and 1988. Unfortunately, they all broke in the nest. So we were able to get into the nest, uh, collect some of the, the remnants of the eggs for chemical analysis. Um, and as I mentioned, DDE is the, the contaminant of concern, and just for, uh, we get about three to five parts per million in the contents of an egg is when you uh, start to see the eggshell thinning. Um, above about 15 parts per million in the contents is where you expect to have complete failure. When we analyzed our eggs, um, compared to other areas that, which were considered contaminated, such as the Great Lakes and along the Columbia River, um, ours had almost twice as much, or over twice as much as you would expect to have any successful hatching. Um, and it turns out that the, the main culprit was the Montrose Chemical Corporation, which is located, was located in Torrance here. And for years, they were discharging uh, DDT contaminated sewage out to the Whites Point outfall into the ocean. Over 1,800 metric tons were discharged. Um, they would also take out 55-gallon barrels, punch a hole in them with an axe, and, and throw them overboard as well. So you can see all of that is between the mainland and the Catalina Island. Um, so the, off the White's Point, there's a Superfund site, um, about 17 square miles of contaminated sediment. So at that point, it was pretty clear that these birds probably weren't going to be hatching their own eggs anytime soon. So we began a manipulation program where each late winter, spring, we would go out, find where the birds were setting up their nests, keep an eye on them every couple of days. And as soon as they would lay their eggs, we'd go in, remove the real eggs, and replace them with artificial eggs. And then the adults uh, would just come back thinking they'd scared off a predator or something, and sit on the eggs for the next three to seven, eight weeks, depending on when we had a chick available. So most of these eggs were transported up to the San Francisco Zoo for incubation, and hopefully four to five weeks later we would get some hatching. So we would keep uh, track of the air cell inside the egg. Um, so that's what all the pencil marks are from when we first took it in to um, when they hatched. And when they get close to the hatching, the, the air just gets bigger and bigger um, very quickly. <laughs> Always a lot of paparazzi. <laughs> So in 
they're not very cute on hatching, but within an hour or two, uh, their down dries out and they become little loud pooping fluff balls. <laughs> um, we start out just feeding them, um, you know, I think it was like a half a gram of food first time just to make sure their digestive system was working um, and slowly moved up. Um, but they, they can eat a lot. They were eating it about every two hours throughout the daylight. Um, unfortunately, the hatching success with the eggs we removed was pretty low. We removed 81 eggs between 89 and 2004, which only 14 or 17 percent um, hatched. So the ones that hatched are in the red and the yellow is um, the number of eggs that were removed that year. Fortunately, the San Francisco Zoo at the time had six to seven breeding pairs of bald eagles, and we were able to get any of the chicks that they produced to bring down to the island to foster. Um, we did begin incubating the eggs uh, on our own in 2005 out on Catalina. Um, we were asked to try to incubate there, both to reduce costs and see if maybe the transportation up to San Francisco Zoo was impacting the hatching success. So. Um, we got our office out in Avalon, uh, set one of the bedrooms up as a, a lab, a cleaning room, and bought some incubators and uh, candlers, and began incubating on our own. Um, and the hatching success increased dramatically. Um, in 2005, I hatched three of nine eggs, which was about double of what the zoo had been able to do. And then in uh, subsequent years, I modified the incubator temperatures, um, the humidity in the room, and got up to, I believe, about 79% hatching success in 2007. So that was uh, sort of amazing. I, th I didn't think <laughs> we were ever going to see anything like that. Um, we used a different type of incubator than the zoo had used. We used what's called a contact incubator. So it mimics the, an actual laying bird. Um, let's see if I can go back to that. So this is the contact incubator on the left. Um, you have a, a platform that you can program to roll at uh, specified intervals. So these eggs are actually on a roller. Um, I programmed it to roll about every 45 minutes, which is what we'd observed in the wild birds as we were doing behavioral observations. It has a balloon in the top, so when you close the lid, I think, you can actually, I think this is actually the balloon you can see here on the upper left. That sort of lays down over the top of the eggs like a, a, the birds would. Um, so you have a temperature gradient in the egg instead of just 99 and a half degrees, which you have in the typical incubator. So this would lay down over the eggs. You could program that to deflate every once in a while, like a bird getting up and, and moving. Um, you can program it to stay off for like 20 or 30 minutes like we would see the birds do. So this whole thing uh, mimicked uh, a real bird more. And I think that played a large part in our success. <laughs> These are the seven chicks from 2007, uh, ranging from a couple hours on the left up to a couple days on the right. And basically, like I said, they were eating every two hours. So you get through the seven, and then you basically go back to the first one. And, um, fortunately, they, they do sleep through the night, so you just turn off the lights, and you're good. Once they're maybe between four and 14 days old, depending on the uh, hours, when we could get them, we would put them in a carrier and take them back to the nest. This is going down to the Twin Rocks nest. Uh, this is one that I used to helicopter to, but then I figured out I could get to it uh, pretty quickly. Basically, we wanted to keep the birds off the nest for less than 20 minutes if possible. Um, after that, there's a tendency for them to abandon. Um, some of the nests where you can't do that, uh, this particular nest would take a couple hours to get to and you're in view most of that time. So we bring over a helicopter, put out a 100 foot rope, attach my harness to it, and this is the dope on the rope. <laughs> This was a slow news day. I think it was a CBS2 news helicopter came over to, to film this. I haven't had to do this, I think, since maybe 2006.
this pilot does heavy lifting, uh, putting air conditioners on building tops. Uh, he can sit you down on a downhill. Mm -hmm. So that's the nest. Uh, I think it was the female. Didn't really want to get up. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was before the GoPro, so the, the video quality is. That's good. actually go out with an antenna and receiver and attract them once they were flying around and a federal and sometimes colored leg band. Um, most of our work throughout the 90s was being funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service as part of a lawsuit against Montrose Chemical for the contaminants. Um, in 2001 there was finally a settlement. Um, all told is about 140 million dollars um, for that settlement. Uh, formed the Montrose Settlements Restoration Program, which has trustees from every major state and federal organization with an interest in the Southern California Bayou. So you have Fish and Wildlife, California Fish and Wildlife, uh, NOAA, I think uh, Parks and Rec, uh, and a couple others. So about 30 million of that lawsuit settlement was put aside for restoration work. And that's what's been funding the Eagles and the Peregrines <coughs> and many other projects for the last uh, 13, 14 years. Um, so once that money was allocated, uh, this MSRP asked us to try to do a similar restoration up on Santa Cruz Island, <laughs> hoping that being further from the, the main contaminant source, that the birds would have a better Later hiked out to it and found it. Um, and they later fledged the first known chick since uh, 1950 on the, on the Channel Islands. Uh, the Mulberry Owl Nest was sort of odd, and um, I was looking at the data, and this female was spending half her day and all night at this location in a field. And it's like, can you guys go out and check this? And they said, we just were out there. Go look again. And they eventually found her just sitting in a field. They put down a few sticks. Uh, laid eggs, and um, that pair also fledged somehow, successfully fledged one Because <coughs> uh, at that time, there were still probably a few pigs on the island, uh, island foxes, skunks. Um, I don't know how they did it. 
So in 2007, because we had that success up on the Northern Islands, uh, because I'd been having more hatching success with the eggs, we decided to leave um, eggs in two nests down in the southern portion of Catalina, um, seal rocks and pinnacle rock, to see if they could actually um, hatch. Um, historically, the seal rocks territory on the, the right side there had the lowest contaminants in the eggs, and um, the female at the pinnacle was the youngest on the island, so we thought maybe she hadn't picked up as much contaminants. So Pinnacle Rock was the first to successfully hatch, and they did fledge two chicks, and Seal Rocks fledged two chicks as well, so that was quite exciting. And I, I really had never expected to see that during my lifetime, or at least my time working out there. Um, so over the next few years, we just let them, um, more and more nests, keep their their eggs on Catalina and um, did nothing with the Northern Islands. Uh, the plan there was to, to not do manipulations. That was just to see if they could, act, in fact, hatch their own eggs. And by 2009, we were no longer taking any eggs from the nests and just letting things go uh, naturally. So to date, we've had 108 chicks fledge successfully, um, just naturally, with no um, help from us. Um, over the years we've hacked 114 birds and fostered an additional 57 birds onto the island. So now we usually range between 12 and 15 chicks uh, successfully fledging per year. Um, since in the last 10 years we've also increased the number of breeding pairs on the islands about 280 um, percent and we now have uh, this the last two years, we've had 19 breeding pairs um, on five different islands this year. So right now, generally there's about 20 to 25 eagles on Catalina at, at any one time. They do come and go. Uh, probably about 30 to 35 on the northern islands. Um, we do have breeding pairs on Anacapa, Santa Cruz, and Santa Rosa up in the north. And then we have three to four eagles out on San Clemente Island, including one breeding pair. So all told, we estimate there's generally about 60 bald eagles on the Channel Islands where there were none uh, in the early 80s. Um, moving on to the peregrine falcon surveys, this is something we started in 2013. Um, their history is similar um, with the DDT. Uh, Reintroduction started a few years after the bald eagle efforts. Um, the Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group released 37 peregrines across uh, four different islands between 83 and 98, um, again using a, a smaller version of the hack towers on cliffs. The first known pair was found on San Miguel Island in 1986. They laid eggs in 87, but they didn't hatch. Um, and then in 89, um, a nest was, with chicks was found on Anacapa Island, and in 1990, another nest on Santa Cruz Island. So those are the first known uh, successful breeding of peregrines. Um, there were surveys uh, in the early 90s, again, for this Montrose uh, lawsuit. Uh, and they found usually eight to nine pairs of peregrines all on the northern Channel Islands. Um, with the settlement money, there was a plan to do peregrine surveys across all the islands um, every five years. And the first year, the Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group got the, the contract to do that and located 27 occupied territories um, on six different islands. <clears throat> now, an occupied territory is just a, a territory where a pair is present, either adults or uh, an adult and a sub-adult. Uh, so basically a, a one-year-old, or there's evidence of reproduction, so chicks, uh, feeding behavior, um, incubation. But there's really not much known about the peregrines out there. Um, the questions that we're looking at now are just basic population parameters. What are the survival rates? Um, what are the rates of movement to and from the islands? Um, is DDT still negatively impacting the reproduction. 
Now, unlike bald eagles, which you can see from a mile away, sitting out on a, a cliff or in a tree, uh, the peregrines are a bit more difficult to spot. So there's one sitting inside that red circle. They blend in with the cliffs. Um, these two are at least sitting out on rocks, but still blend in. And if they don't move or make a noise, uh, they're pretty hard to find. So what we did was um, we began using a, a 10 minute um, survey technique which had been developed by Joe Barnes in Nevada. And what you do with this is you go to a known uh, territory or suspected territory, um, you watch the cliffs for three minutes, you then play a, a 30 second call broadcast of peregrines, uh, watch for another minute, play another 30 seconds, and then watch for five more minutes. And I hope this doesn't disturb your birds too much. <laughs> Go out, you have a call broadcaster, you just spin around, um, playing it in all directions, and as soon as there's a response, either flight or vocalization from a territorial adult, you stop playing it. So using that technique, um, in the first year, we got 58% response rate um, on our first visit to a territory. So essentially, Within 10 minutes, we could determine that over half of the territories were occupied. The typical technique had been, you go to an area, you sit there for four hours. Um, if you don't mm -hmm. see anything, you go back two or three more times during the reading season. And that's how you determine if the, uh, the territory is occupied. So it greatly increased our um, ability to move around and uh, locate birds. Now, typically, peregrines like to nest on 100 plus meter cliffs. This is out on Santa Cruz Island. So that's the nest. It's about 50 meters down the slope. Uh, that's probably Jim Spickler and don't know who else. Um, out on the top, just to give you um, <laughs> size. So once the chicks were usually about three weeks old, we go in, they're much louder than bald eagles. Um, they get a federal leg band and a black leg band with silver um, number letter on it. So you can read the black band through binoculars or a spotting scope, or others, other places can see them. Um, we would also collect any um, eggshell fragments. Um, eggs that didn't hatch would be analyzed for DDE. Uh, the eggshell fragments are measured, their thickness is measured and com compared to that uh, from pre, the pre-DDT era to see if there's still eggshell thinning. Um, but those leg bands have been really uh, useful. Um, this was a bird seen up in central California along the beach, 70 over AC. I um, can't remember exactly which nest. I think it was from Santa Cruz. Um, this one has been at the Sepulveda Dam at, um, in L.A. multiple times. Uh, we've had them, we've had a couple of our birds trapped down uh, near San Diego at turn colonies um, and transported to Northern California for release. I now know where to send the picture we just got in Humboldt County. <laughs> yeah. um, I, cause I think the silver the black and silver are, are West Coast peregrines for sure. Right. I'm not sure if they're used elsewhere. But yeah, if they're one of ours, I can identify it. Um, so this year, we found 48 um, active territories, uh, at least two on every island. Um, we had our first known successful breeding on Catalina this year with two nests producing at least uh, a total of four chicks. Uh, previous years, we've been the last two years, we'd watched the nest and we banded the chicks, um, and they disappeared within a week. So uh, this was the first year where we actually knew that, that they fledged. Uh, the Northern Channel Islands are definitely the stronghold. Um, they have more cliffs. They have much more in the way of food, uh, especially breeding seabirds up on the Northern Islands. Um, so I don't think the Southern Islands are really going to become a, a stronghold for the peregrines uh, just because of available habitat and prey. <coughs> but um, the estimate
estimated, estimate of numbers prior to NBT was about 35 breeding pairs uh, across all the islands. We've definitely gone above that. Um, here we have different surveys um, from 86 through this year. Yellow is systematic, so they actually went out. They tried to cover as much of the islands as they could. Red are more just reports or sightings of, of territories that were active. Um, so the, the real numbers don't jump around like that. It's probably more of a, a straight line going up to the current. But we're, we're definitely at a, a high point right now. I think we could probably add in another 10 to 20 territories, but I think the habitat will get pretty full after that. So right now it really looks like the, the bald eagles and the peregrines um, have recovered from the, from the DDT era. They're all breeding on their own. Uh, we just don't know, um, especially for the peregrines, whether the birds are just leaving the islands. Um, so with our continued banding, hopefully we'll figure out survival, uh, turnover at nests. You know, we have no idea. Is an adult there for a year, for 10 years? Um, with, the, with the bald eagles, all that banding has really shown us a lot about uh, turnover at the nest, and I'm going to be writing a paper hopefully this year on that. There's a lot more turnover at the nest than uh, I ever thought. I don't think any, you know, there's some nests that have had two, three, four females, a couple different males. Um, you know, if they weren't banded, you say, okay, they're back again this year, but it's not the same birds necessarily. So we get a lot of turnover at the nest, and all this continued banding is what helps us learn that. Uh, before I finish, I'd um, just like to acknowledge all the different agencies and groups that have made this research possible, especially the Montreal Settlements Restoration Program and the Fish and Wildlife Service, which have funded this for the last 20 years or so. Um, all the property owners, uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Park Service own all of uh, Santa Cruz Island. Park Service has Anna Kappa, um, Santa Rosa, San Miguel, Santa Barbara. And then the Catalina Island Conservancy, of course, and the U.S. Navy has um, San Clemente and San Nicholas Islands. So without <coughs> their help, we would not be able to get out on these islands. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We know we've heard stories about eagles, you know, you being hit by them. What about peregrines? Do you have any eagles? Yeah, I, didn't bring, I, didn't, I didn't bring my hat. Uh, this year we were, the peregrines really like to die of you because, you know, they're on a cliff. Um, the eagles, you know, half the time you're sort of in the trees or you're banding um, in the trees. With the peregrines, you're more out in the open. Um, Jim Spickler's been the one to climb into most of the nests. and He's got some really nice video of birds really diving in. This year we were at a, a nest on the west end of Santa Cruz, and we were just sort of scoping things out, looking where to set up the ropes. Um, the female came down, grabbed Jim's IWS cap off his head, and dropped it off a cliff. <laughs> uh, I, had, I had my tilly on with the, the neck strap, but it came down and put two hole, ripped two holes in my, oh. my hat, but I, it stayed on my head. Um, the peregrines definitely are more aggressive at the nests. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> Just probably because they're so fast. The bald eagles really don't have the maneuverability to, to go at you like that. The only time I was hit by a bald eagle was from behind. So usually if you look up at them, they just sort of veer away. So this one just came up. <laughs> yes? I have two questions. Okay. First one is, What's going on with the DDT? Are the levels dispersing because it's under the water, um, or is it the same? And then, just let me ask a second one. Yeah. Um, are you finding that there are less birds um, because of the drought that are breeding because there's just the okay. food items out there for um, the last few years? So with the DDT, it's really unclear. Um, EPA did do some sampling and found a significant drop, but it was you know between 2005 and 2009, it, it was like 50 to 80 percent drop, something like that, in contaminants, which I just don't know how that could possibly have happened. Yeah. So I think they're looking at the data to see if maybe they just missed <laughs> the sample spots about the polluted areas. Um, what I've, I have been wondering about is whether ocean acidification might increase the speed at which 
the DDE breaks down because it's about 100 meters, I think, down. So it's sort of an anaerobic um, situation. It's in the sediment on the ocean floor. Um, I don't know what's happening. So eventually, will it just kind of either disperse or <coughs> break down to nothing? Or it'll be there it, should, it should break down, um, but the modeling was like increasing through the 20s and then decreasing towards the end of the century. But that was from the, the late 90s. Um, I don't know what it's doing now. Um, the birds, eagles aren't impacted by the drought because they're mostly fish. Uh, peregrines, I guess we'll sort of see because we haven't had a non-drought year yet that we've been monitoring. Um, they do, I think maybe some of the failures, especially on Catalina, were a uh, lack of food. Um, we were, the two years that we banded that nest on Catalina where they failed, uh, the adults weren't there for the two hours that we were there. So, you know, I think they were having a, a tough time finding food. Um, and I think the chicks probably just starved for the most part. Yes? As long as, long as birds, um, has anybody done pathology on the bald eagles that do die? Are you seeing anything like in the sea lions where the, there's an association with the DDE contamination and uh, neurogenital carcinomas? Uh, I don't think they get that deep into it. Most of the carcasses that we get um, are beyond, <laughs> they've sort of liquefied, so they can't really look at that. Um, we have trapped birds um, as they age, and we, know, we do know that EDE is, increases in the bald eagles with age. So, I mean, they're, they're still picking it up in the system, most likely from dead marine mammals, which concentrated and from goals, which were also shown to be pretty uh, high in contaminants. So feeding on those two things is what we think, is where we think they get most of the contamination. The fish themselves, uh, last time we really looked at them much was in the mid-90s, um, and they didn't have a whole bunch of PDE in them. Um, but once you got further up the food chain, then the, the contaminants were pretty high. Anybody else? I'll be at lunch, so if you're scared to talk out in public. <laughs> <laughs> you said that you, you're trying to get the Pelican Harbor uh, camera moved. Mm -hmm. Did, have you got any response? Um, that? The, the Nature Conservancy is working on a, a permit to allow that. So our hope is to move all the equipment from the Pelican Harbor nest, because I'm tired of chasing them around. <laughs> um, so put we had a fixed camera. I think I'm going to put that on the... Uh, Sauces nest because it's a higher quality and it will make the streaming better. Right now, there's a program I use that every time the computer searches for a DNS address or something, it, it locks up the, the streaming program. So that's so why some, freezing all the time. that's why Sauces is off half the time because I have to, I have to log into the computer and hit refresh on this program. So with this other camera. That program's not necessary, so it should be. And we'll have we'll we'll be able to see the NASA. You'll have you'll have infrared and mm -hmm. audio. Um, and the pan tilt zoom camera we had there, we're hoping to move to the Fraser Point nest, which would be uh, 846 Princess Cruise. The, so the first chick that ever hatched during this project. So we can watch her and her brother breeding. <laughs> <laughs> Which they've been doing successfully, so there doesn't seem to be an inbreeding. So how, how long in order to do the moving before the season starts next year? Um, well, I'll, I mean, I'll probably contact them this week, uh, start moving. Well, all the equipment has been removed from Pelican Harbor, so it's up at the Navy site where we stay. So then we just have to move it just go to the other side. 40 miles <laughs> to the other end of the island and hike it in. So that will take um, probably a few weeks, but um, I just I like to get done by mid-December with any camera work at the nests. Give them two months of no disturbance. Matter of fact, 48 and 48 was at the nest yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So they, I mean, I mean they're around all the time, but they really don't care so much outside the breeding season. 
but I like to give them two months of not seeing me sitting in their nests before, <laughs> before they want to use it. I know when you did the two harbor changing that system around, it took 81 and 82 to come back, what, almost February before they came back to the nest? Yeah, I mean, they were around. Um, and I mean, there's, there's really no need to be at the nest unless you're using it for yeah. breeding. It's just a good place to perch in some of the territories. Other ones, you know, they'll completely leave it alone for five, six months and then come back to it. Which is what I think the, the West End male does. I, I mean, he's around, but there's no evidence that he leaves the island. I just think he goes down the coast a little bit and finds a better fishing spot and just hangs out there for months. I don't know if he'll go this year or not. He's been hanging around too much. Yeah, um, I mean, we saw one or two birds out there last week when we were there. So the female was around and might have been him perched down the coast. <laughs>